Hello and welcome back to our discussion on ischemic heart diseases. In the last session, we had tackled ST elevation MI, which stood for transmural ischemia. Now we'll be tackling another acute coronary syndrome, this time called unstable angina or NSTEM. I'll tell you why there is the or. As all of you, I'm sure remember, it is subendocardial ischemia, where you can see the injury current going away from the lead and subendocardial ischemia that produces the classic ST change, which is called ST depression or sometimes even T inversion. So whenever you have ST depression or T inversion, this in the presence of the appropriate clinical setting, that is anginal chest pain, is what we call unstable angina. So let me just give you the definition. Okay. So clinically, when a person comes to you with angina at rest, angina lasting more than 15 minutes, unlike in chronic stable angina, which always lasts, remember, less than 15 minutes, if the anginal pain is worsening and is not relieved by rest or nitrates, or if the pain in a chronic stable angina patient, if the pain is worsening over the last two weeks and now is in a constantly increasing or crescendo pattern, this is when we should suspect that the patient is having an acute coronary syndrome. Whenever you suspect an acute coronary syndrome, if the patient has an ST depression or T inversion, then we call it an unstable angina. So anginal chest pain, plus ST depression or T inversion is what we call unstable angina. Once you have infarction, that is once the cardiac biomarkers are positive, we will give it an additional name, which is n -STEMI. Unstable angina and n -STEMI are both terms for subendocardial ischemia slash infarction. The two conditions are managed in the same way Hence, we will give it a single name. From now on, unstable angina and STEMI will be combined into an entity called non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes. All right. So with that, we have completed our definition of unstable angina and STEMI or the new name that we are going to give non-ST elevation ACS. So with the clinical features that does not fit into chronic stable angina plus ST depression or T inversion, with or without biomarkers positive, you call it NST elevation acute coronary syndrome, right? So it is an acute coronary syndrome. Why is this important? Simply because even though whenever you think about a myocardial infarction, you think about STEMI, if you look at this graph, you will see, yes, that over the past few years, <clears throat> the one in blue, is basically STEMI and the lower part that's in orange is basically <coughs> the end stem sorry and on the x-axis we have time and as you can see over the years the end STEMI is increasing and STEMIs are decreasing this is because more and more people are coming to a hospital at an earlier stage they are having their ischemic heart diseases diagnosed during the subendocardial state. So you as a clinician will be facing much more NSTEMI than STEMI and you should know how clearly to manage an NSTEMI, right? Okay, with that, we shall move on to the management of NST elevation MI or NST elevation acute coronary syndromes. We will tackle this under various headings the first would be how to manage this in the emergency. A very important part in case of NST elevation ACS is called risk stratification. We will also discuss the definitive management and long-term management after that, right? So let's get to discussing this. We'll start by discussing the emergency management. NST elevation acute coronary syndromes. In the emergency, if you remember ST elevation MI, First thing we did was give the patient aspirin, we give the patient uh, statins, give the patient oxygen. Very similar here. Here, one interesting thing we are going to do is we are going to advise bed rest, okay, complete bed rest, and we monitor the ECG. We didn't say we are monitoring ECG in case of ST elevation because the damage there has occurred. The patient has gone into transmural ischemia. 
Here, remember the patient is still in the subendocardial ischemia stage. If the patient goes into transmural ischemia, that is ST elevation MI, our management will change. That is why in this case, we are doing ECG monitoring, right? The rest of the management is quite similar, oxygen, and you can use uh, aspirin or you can use dual antiplatelet agents. You already know the dual antiplatelet uh, that we use is either clopidogrel or ticagrelor. Uh, statins, atorvastatin, preferably 80 milligrams given to stabilize the plaque. Aspirin, of course, is the 325 milligram chew tablet. Um, ticagrelor and clopidogrel, we have already discussed the dosages. Simultaneously, you can also start anti-ischemic measures um, like uh, beta blockers or uh, morphine or nitrates, just as we had done in the other case. Now, there is a major addition that you should note. In ST elevation MI, you know patient is having transmural ischemia. It is usually due to complete obstruction of the coronaries. There is only one treatment in ST elevation MI that is open up open up the closed coronary, that which is what we call revascularization. However, revascularization is not needed in all NSTACS. The reason, sometimes the thrombus might be so small, it might be so small that it is not really worth doing an invasive procedure and you will not see much of an area to open up. So you need to be very careful in which patients you are going to give the revascularization. One thing that has been shown in NST elevation ACS is that all patients in NST elevation ACS benefit with additional antiplatelet agents in the form of heparin. So apart from aspirin and clopidogrel, we also give antithrombotic agents, sorry, antithrombotic agents in the form of either unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinox, which are much more preferred and easier to titrate. So we can use heparin along with aspirin, statins and DAPT, that is either clopidogrel or ticagrelol according to your availability. So remember, this, are the, this it's very similar to your management of STEMI. Important differences, monitor the ECG. Along with that, start heparin right now. In case of STEMI, if you try and recall, where is the use of heparin? Yes, in that is in case you have a thromboembolic phenomenon. Here, we give heparin in all patients, right? The definitive management of NSTEMI is revascularization. That is basically doing an angiography. And if it is but if it is possible to do, open up the thrombus by doing a percutaneous coronary intervention. However, as I said, people who are having a, a subendocardial infarct can progress to a transmural infarct. In those patients, we have to be a little more aggressive in our management, and we sometimes have to manage it like a STEMI. So in as in STEMI, sometimes in some end STEMI, we might have to do an immediate opening of the, um, the, the thrombus. So either you do it like a STEMI where you do an immediate intervention in which we, we, we open up the clot within two hours. In some other patients who are at a lesser, lesser risk category, we can wait up to 24 hours. Okay? That's called early invasive. Right? So we have an immediate invasive. As soon as the patient comes in, you do it. Or else you do an early invasive. That is, you do it within, that is, you do a angiography, an angioplasty, uh, PCI, within 24 hours. That's called early invasive. In some other patients, you can wait a little longer. You can wait beyond 24 to 70, up to 72 hours. That is what we call delayed invasive. And in some patients, we can sometimes avoid an angiography completely. Okay, so you might ask, why do we have to really think about it in this way? The reason is not all patients are having complete obstruction of the coronaries. And we might, we, the advantage of delaying the angio, angioplasty in many of these patients is that many of the time the patient will be coming to you with severe angina, maybe breathlessness, tachycardia. It is always better to have a more stable patient, a patient who is not hypotensive, a patient who doesn't have tachycardia. So first stabilize the patient and then do an angiography as time permits. Okay, so to decide, so to recap, 
What are the types of definitive management? It is either what we call immediate invasive, within two hours you're going to do an angioplasty, early invasive where you're going to do an angioplasty within 24 hours, or you have delayed invasive, in which case you will do it within 24 to 40, 72 hours. Or sometimes you don't do an angioplasty at all, but you let the ischemic features guide you. So what are the conditions? You should remember this. What are the conditions in which you should do an immediate invasive? That is within two hours. Technically, we are treating this patient like a STEMI. Suppose you're having a patient who's come to you with refractory or recurrent angina despite management, despite your treatment. If the patient has heart failure, hypotension or shock. So a patient who's coming to you with unstable angina or NSTEMI and the angina is not improving. Patient is in heart failure, patient is in shock or patient is having arrhythmias. In such people, we will definitely try to go for what is called immediate invasive. Treat it just like it is an ST elevation MI. Now, early invasive or delayed invasive. To, do the, to understand who requires which, we do something called risk stratification. We will now see what are the types of scores that we use for risk stratification. Prior to that, let me just tell you two important differences between the management of NSTEMI and STEMI. One is that all complications of STEMI can happen in NST elevation ACS also, but the chances of these complications are much lesser. The second important point that you should know is that there is no benefit of fibrinolysis. Okay, unlike in ST elevation MI, we don't do fibrinolysis in patients with NST elevation acute coronary syndromes. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's now look at how to do the risk stratification to decide whether a patient requires early invasive or delayed invasive. Okay, for risk stratification, there are many scores that are available. In fact, there are uh, there is a gray score, there is a Timmy score. However, most clinicians prefer to use the gray score. The gray score, if you have a look over here, you will see that it incorporates such things such as heart failure, the blood pressure of the patients, heart rate, age, uh, any other cardiac complications and cre serum creatinine. Now, involving all these, we have different scores for uh, the uh, each of these parameters and uh, a total score depending upon the total score you can classify these patients as belonging to different risk groups right so let's have a look at what are these risk groups you are in low risk if you are less than 108 between 108 to 140 it is considered intermediate risk and uh, 141 plus is considered high risk you can see that as the risk increases it is directly proportional to the probability of death in these patients. High risk patients, high risk of mortality require early invasive management. Low risk patients, you might even wait till you are till your patient is stable. Okay. It's very easy to calculate the gray score in your uh, clinics simply because it is available as mobile apps nowadays. Okay, so don't get put off by the many number of parameters and complex uh, calculations. You don't need to learn it by heart. It is available in on mobile apps it's very easy to calculate the gray score nowadays right so once you have a gray score and you have a risk estimate whether the patient is high risk low risk or intermediate risk you can get down to the definitive management as i said the definitive management is revascularization okay in patients who have any of the danger signs you know the danger signs that is hypotension if the patient is having um, uh, heart failure signs, if the patient's angina is not improving or the patient has arrhythmias, these are the patients you take for revascularization within two hours. This is called the immediate invasive strategy. The next group are those people who we will take for what is called early invasive. These are those people who have high gray scores. Gray scores more than 140. One, you should take up for angiography between 24 hours. This is called early invasive. <coughs> Sorry. The delayed invasive strategy is when you have intermediate or low risk, that is gray score less than 141. You can wait till your patient is stable beyond 72 hours. There are some select group of patients who are low risk, who are 
who are who might even have troponin negative in such people you can even wait till the patient develops any further signs of ischemia so to revise if the patient has any danger signs like refractory angina hypotension heart failure take up the patient for invasive uh, procedure that is angiography within 2 hours if the patient is having a high gray score more than 141 we need early invasive that is within 24 hours if the patient is having intermediate gray, around, uh, gray score that is less than 141 we usually wait till 72 hours after the patient is stable this is called delayed invasive in some selected patients who have very low gray scores less than 108 no troponin positive we can even manage the patient medically and do an angiography only if the patient develop further signs of ischemia right so now coming to the long term management of these patients after doing the revascularization that is after the angioplasty or in some patients we might even go for cabg we will see when we discuss uh, chronic stable angina uh we can then mobilize the patient that is the patient can start walking about 1 to 2 days after you discharge the patient within a week if there are no complications and uh, the patient returns to regular activity within a month so quite similar to our st elevation mi lifestyle modification exercise diet uh, smoking cessation all of this will continue just like in stemi in the long term management double antiplatelet therapy dapt is very important at least for one year at least for one year of life we usually give the patient dual antiplatelet therapy and beyond that the patient needs to continue lifelong aspirin as well statins also have to be con continued throughout their life you should control other risk factors like diabetes and hypertension so to summarize in the management of nst elevation mi first you should be able to recognize an nst elevation mi that is patient presenting with angina st having depression or t wave inversion if these two are there you call it nstemi or sorry you call it unstable angina if the biomarkers are also elevated then you will call it nstemi no need to think of them as two separate entities you call it nst elevation acute coronary syndrome when a patient comes to you in the emergency you give them antiplatelets you give them statins you also start heparin very important you also start heparin in these patients and then along with the anti anginal agents you will take a call on whether to go for revascularization immediately or that is you can do it in a delayed fashion immediate angiography is required in those patients having heart failure arrhythmias or the patient is going into uh, refractory angina early if the patient does not have any of this you don't need to take it up within 2 hours in case of uh, other patients you can then classify them using the gray score as early invasive early invasive high gray scores do your angiography angioplasty pci within 24 hours in case your gray score is not on the higher side less than 140 you have time then stabilize the patient and do it within 72 hours that is delayed invasive very selected patients they do not have uh, a high gray score less than 108 is the gray score and uh, the patient is uh, uh, having troponin uh, uh, negative you can wait even longer and unless there are no signs of ischemia you can wait that's called ischemia guided therapy so four ways in which you can intervene in these patients and after intervention lifelong they need to continue antiplatelet statins lifestyle modification and all the other works ah by the way i'm sorry i did not tell you that grace stands for global registry of acute coronary events g r a c e right the other timi score is thrombolysis in mi right that's just for those purposes and uh, yes so with that we have completed our discussion on the emergency management risk stratification and the definitive and long term management in nst elevation acute coronary syndrome now i'll let you in on a small tip there is a condition which is called wellen syndrome so if you look at this ecg carefully you will see that it is an ecg of a person having st depression where are you seeing the st depressions Okay. rather than st is depression what you are seeing here are deep 
T inversions. Deep T inversions which are seen in leads V1, V2, V3, V4. If you remember leads V1 to V4, not as leads V1 to V4. If a person comes to you with an angina and there are T inversions in lead V1 and to V4, deep symmetric T waves in leads V1 to V4, T inversions, always be suspicious. These are patients who are having a subendocardial ischemia of the left anterior descending artery territory. It is a very dangerous artery to have a problem in. You can have a complete thrombus of the same artery very rapidly from the state. Wellen syndrome is one condition where you should be watching your patient very closely because LAD territory and STEMIs can progress to STEMI very, very rapidly. So this is one end STEMI which you might think about doing an early invasive strategy, right? So with that, we have completed our discussion on end STEMI. You can try and answer one of the questions beyond below uh, the in the in the notes, and uh, we shall carry on with our discussion in the next part of the session.